The Rational Apprentice podcast is linear rather than topical. This means that the podcast should be listened to in order. This also means that skipping episodes will prevent you from fully understanding the concepts being presented and may cause you to miss or misconstrue vital proofs. That being said, welcome to the Rational Apprentice podcast. Way back in episode three, I read a quote by Galambos in which he gave his definitions of the words freedom and liberty. Episode three, as I've mentioned before, is not my favorite episode. I think I gave it to you far too early for it to be useful. Regardless, it was a long time ago, so I'm going to go over at least this part of it again now that you have more context. In volitional science, the word liberty is defined as the condition that exists when an individual has full 100% control over his own property. In other words, you have liberty when you have full 100% control over your life and 100% control of the primary and secondary derivatives of your life. And the word freedom in volitional science is defined as the societal condition that exists when each person has full 100% control of their property. Or to put it simply and to emphasize the connection between the two, Freedom is the societal condition that exists when every individual possesses liberty. Now, right off the bat, you may react to these definitions by saying, whoa, that's a really high bar. 100% control is impossible. That would never happen. That's utopian. Well, absolutely. That is a high bar. First, the phrasing full 100% control leaves no room for ambiguity. There is no question as to the quantity of control we're talking about when it comes to the amount of his own property an individual must control in order to have liberty. And the same is true for freedom. The term every person does not mean most people or some people. It means every person. Again, 100% of people. When every 100% of people possess liberty, then you have a societal condition called freedom. These are not only semantically precise definitions, they are operational definitions in that they also give us a way to measure our progress. If 50% of the people have liberty and the rest are slaves, there is no freedom. If 75% of the people have liberty and the rest are slaves, there is no freedom. If 99% of the people have liberty and the rest are slaves, guess what? There is no freedom. So yes, this is a high bar. And while that bar will never be reached, it must be the goal, reaching for the stars. But let me ask you this. If freedom, wherein every single person controls 100% of their own property, is not the goal, how will we as individuals and as part of a society know where we are in proximity to the goal? And what possible justification can you give for aiming any lower than 100%? And which portion of the derivatives of an individual's life should be controlled by others? We use the word freedom all the time in conversations, on t-shirts, on posters. We even have entire festivals dedicated to it. But how can we know what others are actually striving for when they say that freedom is the goal if they don't have a specific operational definition like this? Let's use an example. SpaceX lifting off the ground all the time and the Artemis mission just launched for the moon. But gee, escape velocity is an awful high bar to attain. Let's just settle for 75% of escape velocity. That'll be good enough. Will that work? No, of course not. And it'll give a new meaning to the term splashdown. The same thing is true of volitional science. The concepts are the same. Now, the word utopian comes from Sir Thomas More's 15th century book entitled Utopia, the word coming from the Greek, utopis, which essentially means nowhere or no such place. In his book, Utopia, Moore described an island society in which everyone's perfect. And in this perfection, they all shared common goals, ideologies, and a common culture. But the problem is, is that man is not perfect. 
We all make mistakes all the time. Sir Thomas More's book, Intentionally or Not, was a satire on the political and societal complexities of his day. Now, over the past few episodes, we've been discussing the true and most basic nature of man. And just as in physics, where the universe follows a set of rules, the laws of thermodynamics, these natural laws are inalterable. For example, you will fail trying to build a perpetual motion machine. Attempts have been made throughout the centuries and continue to be made today. But each and every attempt defies one or more of the laws of thermodynamics, and thus they have and will continue forever to fail. Because they must. The same is true for societies which, over the centuries, have tried to structure rules and laws based upon that which is alien and against the natural laws of human nature. Regardless of how desirous our so-called rulers have been to change that nature throughout history, it is observable that man cannot change his nature. And it is equally observable that each and every society that has tried it has eventually fallen. Thomas More's utopian idea was more of the same, an ideal communism which would require the alteration of the nature of man in order to be viable. And hence, his title was quite appropriate. Hey, I'm Scotty, and welcome to the Rational Apprentice Podcast, where we discuss solutions to humanity's problems derived from the application of the scientific method. We also discuss and practice things like logic and logical argumentation, reasoning and evidence, the unknown, forgotten, or underappreciated scientists and philosophers in our history, and of course, the mind of a murder case of the week. In keeping with the laws of thermodynamics, you may have noticed in your life that there is always give and take when it comes to just about everything you do. If you want more heat, you have to use more fuel. If you need more torque, you have to give up some speed. If you want more success in your career, you'll have to give up more of your time. There's always give and take, amazingly enough, in keeping with the laws of physics, specifically the law of conservation of energy that says energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Or, more aptly for volitional science, you can't get something from nothing. Want lots of energy, but you also want to use less coal? Sure, but you'll have to use more lithium and cobalt, which are arguably worse for the environment. The list of examples goes on and on and on. The natural laws apply in physics at all times, and they also apply to us in our societal interactions. Well, why? Because we live here in the universe. We are products of this universe and these rules of how the universe operates. So it's only natural we would evolve in a way that is completely compatible with our environment. Man, too, possesses a certain unchangeable nature. And just as you can't build a perpetual motion machine or a so-called free energy generator, because it defies the laws of nature, neither can you build a stable and durable society that defies the laws of nature. Which brings me to the definition of the word impossible. What is the common usage for the word impossible? Well, when most people say that something is impossible, what they really mean is that they don't know how to do it, and they can't figure it out, and neither can they imagine that anyone else can figure it out either. So that's impossible, right? But the same was said about just about every technology we have today. That's impossible. Think about, think about the communicator from the original Star Trek, the black handheld box with the gold flip up top. It's an iconic device, to say the least. And certainly, while the entire show was an inspiration for so many technologies, it's kind of hard to quantify. But if you really consider that communicator in terms of what we have now, even it is completely obsolete. All it does is allow voice communication. There's no video. There's no database interactions. There's no temperature sensors, no file sharing, no games, no maps, no direction, altitude, humidity, pressure, or depth sensors. There was no data capabilities at all on that thing. And it was huge. Frankly, if you went to AT&T or Verizon, 
or whatever your mobile carrier is, and that was the phone they were offering to you, you'd laugh at it and walk out. But in 1960, that was said to be impossible. That was the epitome of high-tech dreaming a mere 60 years ago. In 1900, the very idea that you could get from New York to London in less than five days was simply pie-in-the-sky ridiculous. Impossible. But 50 years later, not 100, not 75, but just 50 years later, those five days had been reduced to 10 hours. The ships improved in that time, but even in 1950, they could only do it in four days. But with the innovation of the airplane by those two crazy brothers who thought they could fly, believe it or not, that's what people of the time thought. They thought they were crazy thinking that they could fly as they flew overhead. Right? Not 50 years later, we were crossing the Atlantic in just 10 hours. Flying in a heavier-than-air machine, that was impossible for thousands of years. Until it wasn't. Watching the ball drop on New Year's Eve in New York from a box in California in real time with synchronized sound sent around the world at 186,000 miles per second. That was impossible until it wasn't. And now SpaceX is sending rockets that have reusable boosters that land themselves on a tiny X painted on the back of a floating platform. And we don't even talk about it. It's, it's so commonplace. But when the space shuttle was launched, not once a week as we have now, but only a couple of times a year during the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, the very idea of that kind of precision was, guess what? Impossible. So no, that's not what impossible means. Clearly, because here we are doing the impossible. No. The term impossible means specifically that which, in order to be accomplished, requires changing or repealing a law of nature. So we return to the volitional science definitions of freedom and liberty. Is freedom impossible? Well, what law of nature would have to be repealed or changed in order for freedom to be achieved, for each and every person to share a goal of 100% control over their own property? None. But does that mean that it will be easy? No, it doesn't. Okay, Difficult and impossible are two very different terms. We're faced with the problems of society. These are the problems I've listed many times. Continually creeping taxation, inadequate transportation, overpopulation, skyrocketing inflation, never-ending war, increasing crime, race riots, inadequate education, increasing unemployment, traffic-ridden highways, increasing pollution, and all the rest. And we look at these problems and we say to ourselves that it's impossible to find solutions. We've been trying to find the solutions for 6,000 and more years. And as you can see, each and every day, things are getting decidedly worse. So it's time to start looking in the right place, using the right tool. And we know what that tool is. It's the one tool that has proven over and over again to singularly help us solve our problems and transform those things that society at large was convinced was impossible into the possible. The solution is here, now. You're listening to it, but we're just getting started. I know it's taking a while, but this is challenging stuff. The solution is possible. The solution is deep, and it's consistent with the scientific method using truth and validity as its basis for proof. But I did not say at any time that it was easy. No, it's not easy. No great innovation, no great accomplishment is ever easy, or else it wouldn't be called a great accomplishment. No, it's not going to be easy. Was it easy to get to the moon? No. Was it easy to build the first airplane? No. Was it easy to innovate the phones, the TVs, the computers? No, but it was done. We all have them. This won't be easy either, but it's doable, and the effort is worth it. This solution will make archaic the idea that war 
is the answer to anything. That theft is the answer to anything. That slavery and coercion are the answers to anything. In the same way that it was thought that ideas such as burning so-called witches at the stake would rid ourselves of bad crop yields and inclement weather, or that leeches and bleeding would cure you of ailments. It's called reducio ad absurdum. Together, we will, as you continue to look through the tube, reduce all past ideas of how to structure a society to the absurdities that they are. You will be one of the fortunate to fully understand not only what the solution is, but how it can be accomplished. All right, everyone, that'll do it for today. Let me remind you that in order to get the weekly Mind Over Murder case notes, you'll need to sign up for the weekly Substack newsletter. In addition to the Mind Over Murder case notes, we'll have studies, practices, courses, and bonus materials coming out in the near future, and I know you're going to want to get a hold of those when they come out. So head on over to therationalapprentice.substack.com to sign up for free right now. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.